Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God I'd like to focus on this morning. We'll take a look at Daniel 6, but we'll include references to the other readings. That's all in your worship folder if you'd like to follow along. So how do you think the world is receiving or reacting to God's Word these days? Excited to hear it? Or maybe pushing against it? I don't know if today is really that much different than generations or decades or millennia before. Because in our gospel reading, Jesus told us that we should expect persecution. He said to his disciples, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Be on your guard. You'll be handed over. You'll be flogged on my account. You'll be brought before governors and kings. They'll arrest you. Brother will betray brother. A father is child. Children will rebel against their parents. And everyone will hate you because of me. He said, when you're persecuted in one place, flee to another. Because it's not going to end until he comes. The question isn't really... Will we be persecuted? The question is, how will we react when we are persecuted? Of course, our natural reaction might be to protect ourselves, to shelter or insulate, which would also include hiding our faith or God's word. But that's not what God wants. And so today, as we remember men like Martin Luther and many others involved in the Reformation, as we even remember the apostles and and take a look at Daniel, the Holy Spirit will encourage us to trust God, even in the face of persecution. Daniel knew what it was like to be persecuted for his faith. Last week we heard in Daniel chapter 1 that about 600 years before Jesus was born, God sent King Nebuchadnezzar and the mighty Babylonian army against his people, the southern kingdom of Judah. Over 100 years earlier, God had sent the Assyrians and they totally wiped the northern kingdom of Israel off the face of the earth. They, They no longer existed. That wasn't God's plan here, but because his people consistently refused to listen to him because they regularly worshipped other gods or, or just went about their lives as if there was no God, God was sending this foreign army as a wake-up call to them. And King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, they wouldn't just attack, they would conquer the kingdom of Judah and the capital city of Jerusalem, including the temple, would be totally destroyed. Before that happened, Nebuchadnezzar began sending people from Jerusalem to go live in Babylon, and that included Daniel. Daniel and his family and his friends, they had to learn the language of the Babylonians. They had to eat the food of the Babylonians. They had to to learn the literature and the history of the Babylonians. And they were told they also needed to worship the gods of the Babylonians. (laughs) In fact, maybe you remember what happened in chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar built a statue of himself, and he demanded that when any of the people heard the instruments play, they should all bow down and worship that statue or be thrown into a fiery furnace. But through all of those years, through decades, God preserved and protected Daniel. In fact, God blessed Daniel. He rose to the top of his class, as we heard last week. He became one of the top advisors to the king, and and God used Daniel for his own benefit, for his kingdom. In fact, Daniel survived not just through the Babylonians, but until the next major power of the world, which were the Medes and the Persians. The new king of the Medes and Persians liked Daniel so much, he was ready to make him the top advisor. But that put Daniel in some political trouble. Much as we hear on the news today, some of the other advisors were jealous of Daniel. And so they began to look for any way that they could get Daniel out of office. They wanted to charge him with a crime, a wrongdoing, a misdemeanor. I mean, anything that would cause the king to get rid of Daniel. Because Daniel didn't belong there. He was in their position, and he wasn't even supposed to be in their country because he was a foreigner. He was a Jew, and how dare the king make him the top advisor? The problem was that Daniel was an upstanding man. He did his job very well, and they couldn't find any way to charge him until they realized the only way they could trap Daniel 
was through his faith. And so these advisors went to the new king and, and they told him how great he was. And he said, king, you're so great. You should make a new law that if anyone prays to any other God or human being except you, your majesty, they should be thrown into the lion's den. The king thought that was a great idea. So he said, let it be written into the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed or changed. Now they had Daniel. Because they knew that Daniel would remain faithful to his God. And he did. Three times a day, Daniel went home, opened his windows toward Jerusalem, toward the temple, toward God, so to speak, and he got down on his knees and he prayed. Did you notice what he prayed, though? He gave thanks to God. Even though he was living a long way from home in a foreign empire that did not worship the true God, three times a day, Daniel got down on his knees and he thanked God. And he did what he had always done, even though the king had made this new law that you couldn't pray to anyone else or you'll be thrown into the lion's den. Daniel had to know that the enemies were trapping him. And they did. But Daniel wasn't worried. Daniel trusted God. He trusted that either God would keep him out of the lion's den or that God would protect him in the lion's den or that God would use those lions to take Daniel out of this world and to himself in heaven. Daniel couldn't lose. He was good. But the king was worried when the other advisors came to the king and said, didn't you make a law that you can't pray to anyone else? Well, did you know that Daniel's been praying three times a day to his God? He needs to go into the lion's den. I mean, the king tried his best to find a way to keep Daniel out of the lion's den, but the law was the law. And so in Daniel went, and the king could barely handle it. He, he, Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. And he, he didn't eat that night, no entertainment. He couldn't sleep. He just waited until the next morning. And he ran to the den, and he yelled into the tomb, Daniel, did your God, whom you serve continually, save you? Which is illogical. Who would expect that somebody could live through that? But Daniel did. Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel to shut the mouths of the lions because God knew, king, that I was innocent. And king, you know that I have done you no wrong. The last verse of our reading from Daniel says that when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he trusted in his God. Daniel wasn't the only one to face persecution for his faith. As Jesus told his disciples, they too faced persecution. You probably didn't know it, but we just got done celebrating the days remembering Simon and Jude, two of Jesus' disciples. And all of them, except the Apostle John, who was exiled to an island, they all died a martyr's death. Tradition has it that this one, I think that Simon, was sawed in half. Almost immediately when the disciples began to tell people that Jesus was the Son of God who lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and rose from the dead, they were being hauled into courts and being told to shut it or go to prison. And they said, we must obey God rather than men. And they went to prison and they faced a martyr's death because they trusted in God. Martin Luther wasn't much different Martin Luther never intended to begin or start a new church, the Lutheran church. He just wanted to reform the false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, in which he was a member and a monk. They had been teaching that in order to get to heaven, you had to do two things. First, you had to do what they called penance, which is to make up for your sins. And then you had to go do enough good things to hopefully earn your way into salvation. And if you did it, maybe somebody else would donate their good works to you. And Luther realized, I think he knew in his conscience, we can't do that. There is nothing that we can offer God to pay for a single sin, much less all of our sins. And if we can't pay for our sins, how are we supposed to do enough good things to earn our way into heaven? He knew in his heart we can never do that. Which is exactly what the Apostle Paul told us in our reading from Romans. 
No one will be declared righteous by works of the law. We simply cannot. Instead, Luther discovered that, as Paul said in Romans 3, God provides a different righteousness. God provides his own righteousness through Christ. God brought Jesus to be a sacrifice of atonement, to pay for our sins. And God credits those who believe in him with Christ's righteousness. Luther thought this was the greatest thing ever, and it is. And he wanted everyone to know we are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. But those in power, they didn't want to hear that. And so first, the leader of the church excommunicated Luther, kicked him out. And then the Holy Roman Emperor, who was probably the most powerful man at the time in the world, made him an outlaw. Meaning that anyone who wanted to could kill Luther with no repercussions. At first, Luther's elector, the, his governor in charge, hid him, protected him. But Luther realized he couldn't remain in hiding. And so eventually he came out and he continued to publicly preach and teach and write so that everyone would know that we are saved not by works, but by grace through faith in Christ. That put Luther in danger. But he wasn't worried. And God protected him. He died almost 30 years after the Reformation began of health issues. But God said that you're going to be like that too. That if you live your faith, that if you are willing to proclaim your faith publicly to others, you can expect to face persecution. I'm guessing you already have, to some degree. We all have family and friends who think or maybe even say that our faith is a waste of time. You know, why do you go to church and read your Bible? And, and why are you trying so hard to live up to these old-fashioned standards and morals? In fact, I was scrolling through YouTube yesterday, which is always a bad idea. And, and I came across this video of a pastor, and he was being interviewed on a major news network. And he made a statement, and their reaction was, wow, is it that kind of old-fashioned? And the pastor said, listen, it's not my job to tell you what you want to hear. It's my job to tell you what God says. But they literally laughed in his face. And you've seen that on the news, too. The world today doesn't really accept God's account of creation. The world is beginning to outwardly attack God's definition of sex and gender and marriage and family. And the world wants you to think that you are one of the biggest fools on this planet if you believe all of that stuff. Because after all, isn't it just written by men and therefore full of errors? And I wonder if that's just the beginning. I'm wondering how long it will be before it's literally a crime for me to stand in front of you and tell you what God says. It's already being labeled as intolerant and racist and, and bigotry and, and not loving. When will that turn into a group of people chasing you down with clubs or guns and threatening you to deny Christ or face the consequences? We haven't had to deal with that kind of persecution in America for 200 plus years. But it's happening around the world. So how are we going to react? Are we going to shelter? Are we going to hide? Are we going to take this little light of ours and put it under a bushel basket? That's kind of the natural reaction, isn't it? I probably shouldn't tell you stories like this, but I remember when I was in college, I was still in Watertown at the time, and so we were young boys looking for trouble, and we usually find it in Madison, but whenever we went to Madison, inevitably somebody would ask us, so where do you go to school? Oh, we go to this little school in, in Watertown, and what are you studying? Oh, we're getting our Bachelor of Arts degree. You dare not say, well, we're going to be Lutheran pastors in the middle of Madison when you're looking for trouble, because then you might not fit in. They might make fun of you. They might send you home. So what do we do? Well, today, the Holy Spirit encourages us to trust God. 
That really begins by trusting that God's word is true. Remembering that, yes, men wrote the words, but they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That all scripture is God-breathed. And if the Bible is God's word, then it is true in every part and in every way. Not just in, quote, spiritual matters, but in geography and geology and and history and astrology and, and math and science and all of the rest of it. That means that when God says he created the world in six 24-hour days from nothing, simply by speaking his word, that's how it happened. It means that when God said he created male and female and he brought Eve to Adam and the two became one flesh so that they could have children and establish the basic unit of society, that's true. It also means that when the Bible says all have sinned, that's true. That we are sinful from birth. We're not good people deep down inside. We are terrible sinners who are born without true fear of God or true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. No one wants to hear that. But it's true. But it's also true that all are justified. That through faith in Christ... God offers the forgiveness of all of our sins that God presented his son as a sacrifice of atonement to pay for every sin of every person that's ever lived and that through Christ, God has given us his own righteousness that God provides the very righteousness or holiness that he himself demands and he did it through Christ. Jesus knows what it's like to be persecuted. At home, when his family thought he was going a little nuts because he kept telling everybody he was the son of God. When his own people, God's chosen people, who had the prophets and Moses and Abraham and this long history, they were the ones who should know the Messiah was coming and they rejected him too. When the very leaders of the church were the ones who hated Jesus the most. When the government at the time that was oppressing Israel didn't care and just threw him on the cross. But because Jesus was willing to suffer and die for us, I can tell you every single week, God has forgiven all of your sins. And because Jesus rose from the dead on Easter Sunday morning, I can assure you that there is life even after death, which means that you can trust God. Even when you face persecution, Whether it's personal rejection because of the way that the people around you think about God or faith or your faith, or or whether it's on a much larger scale because you're tired of watching the news, or whether you feel like you're actually in physical danger in a way that you've never felt before, you can trust God because only three things can happen. Either God will continue to protect you and keep the danger away, which he has done for so long. Or, if you are, so to speak, thrown into the lion's den, God can give you the strength to deal with that too. Or, God will deliver you from evil by taking you out of this world to himself in heaven. You can't lose. That doesn't mean that it will be easy. It just means that through it all, God will give us the strength. The question is not, will you be persecuted for your faith? The question is, how will you react? And while our natural reaction might be to protect ourselves and to hide our faith and to say things like, well, this is just between me and God, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. But don't worry about what to say or how to say it. The Spirit will be speaking through you. And even when you face persecution, you can trust God. May he give us strength for the times to come. Amen.